Hey everyone, this is Stefan from projectlifemastery.com and today I'm gonna to share with you guys my stock investment portfolio. I'm gonna be very transparent, I'm gonna pull aside the curtains and I'm actually gonna show you guys, I'm gonna log into my brokerage accounts and actually show you my entire stock investment portfolio. I'm gonna share with you the entire value of everything, what I own, what I buy, the dividends I receive on a monthly basis, and just my overall approach, mindset, and strategy when it comes to investing so that hopefully you guys can benefit and learn a lot from this. I'm not doing this to try to impress you or anything like that, but to hopefully educate you. Um, I know for myself, when I first started off as an investor, I wish that someone would share behind the scenes of a multi-million dollar stock investment portfolio. I think there's a lot you can learn from that. Now, uh, I will mention that uh, two years ago, I did a similar YouTube video than this, where I shared my $1 million stock investment portfolio. Uh, that video did re really well, got over 160,000 views on YouTube, and a lot of people have asked me since then to share more of an update, and I do share my goals reports, my, my net worth updates, and my income updates, and things like that. So I thought it'd be useful to, to kind of share with you guys um, where I'm at today with my investments. Um, now, also, I will mention that $1 million is Canadian dollars. I live in Canada. My brokerage accounts are Canadian brokerage accounts, although I do invest in the U.S. markets as well, and I'll share with you guys that. Uh, but anyway, since then, over the last two, two years, less than two years now, actually, I've been able to grow that to over $3.5 million Canadian, which at the time of this, I'm recording this in May of 2018, is about $2.7 to $2.8 million U.S., which is still a significant amount of money. Um, now, Going from one million to three and a half million is not from capital appreciation or gain. So I wanna make that clear. I wish that I could turn a million to three and a half million uh, in two years that fast. Fortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, obviously, I've been earning more in my businesses. I invest more into to different stocks and I've been building it up that way. And I've also been get, getting a great return uh, from my investments as well. And I also earn a, uh, get a dividend payments uh, from my investments on a monthly, quarterly, or, or annual basis too. Um, now, a few things I wanna mention for you guys just to kinda of explain my overall approach and mindset before I share with you guys my brokerage accounts. I got it, started investing when I was 18 years old. I read the books The Wealthy Barber by David Shilton, The Richest Man in Babylon, all those kind of you know, classic investing books, and it really emphasized and taught me the importance of paying myself first. That no matter how much money you're making, you always take 10% of that you put it aside, you save it, and you invest it. And if you're just investing that over time, what happens is that compounds. And when you have time on your side over 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, a small amount of money can actually turn into a significant amount of money. And so I've always kind of believed in that. And so my overall mindset is I'm a long-term investor. I'm also very conservative. I use my businesses, the online businesses that I have, primarily to generate cash flow. Because business, for me at least, is the easiest and fastest way to generate a large amount of cash. And then with that, I take that and then I invest it in more conservative investment vehicles like stocks that can grow and compound over a period of time. I do have some risky investments, but for the most part, 90% of what I do is more conservative, okay? Now, I don't just invest in stocks. I believe in being diversified. I also own a real estate property that I've been renting out for many years. I own cryptocurrency, I've done loans, I own different types of investments like that too. Um, so I believe that's important, but the majority of my wealth, uh, I, I invest it in different stocks and everything. And the reason why I like stocks is you can get a lot of diversity from that. I think a lot of people have a misconception where they think all stocks are risky, and it's not true. Yes, there are certain stocks that are risky, but there's also a lot of blue chip companies and stocks that you can own and have a piece of that have been around for, for, for decades and will continue to be around for decades moving forward. So um, I like to invest more in blue chip stocks. I like to invest in bank stocks. For example, the Bank of Montreal in Canada it's been, you know, has never missed a dividend payment in over 100 years and is most likely, you know, it's been through recessions and depressions and things like that. It's gonna continue to to, to be a very secure bank and everything too. So I don't need to worry about losing everything by owning a bank stock, typically. I can also own index funds where I can own a stock that's diversified in a certain market. So for example, I can own an S&P 500 index fund where I own pieces of the top 500 companies in the United States on the S&P index. So that's very diversified. That's gonna go up and down based on the overall market. It's not putting everything into one stock where you, know, you could lose all your money from that. 
I like owning real estate, but I don't like managing real estate. So oftentimes I prefer if I want to be involved in the real estate market, I can own stocks that are known as REITs, real estate investment trusts, that can own real estate. And I don't have to manage it. You know, I've got a rental property I've had for many years and it's a lot of work. You know, there's repairs, there's issues with tenants, they, they move out, you can, there's a lot of logistics with that, that if you have a property manager, that's great. But when you own a REIT, I can own commercial real estate, residential real estate, and, and a variety of different things in different marketplaces. And it's also more liquid too. I don't have to try to sell the real estate property one day. It's just a lot easier to sell a stock. And so you can liquidate your assets a lot easier that way too. What's the beautiful thing about stocks is that you don't have to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to run a business. Because running a business is a lot of hard work. You know, I don't have to build Amazon to a multi-billion dollar, one of the biggest businesses out there. I don't have to do that and I don't want to do that. I, you know, I'd much rather instead, I don't have to be Jeff Bezos, I can invest in Jeff Bezos and own shares of Amazon and benefit from his expertise and his brilliance and genius and I can benefit from that. I don't have to build Tesla, I can invest in Elon Musk and invest in Tesla and, and, and benefit from that. I don't have to be Mark Zuckerberg, I can invest in Facebook and invest in Mark Zuckerberg and benefit from that. So it really allows you to leverage yourself in a lot of really amazing ways by leveraging other people's expertise, knowledge and, and things of that nature. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about it. Now, also I should mention too, my ultimate goal when it comes to investing, you've gotta always make sure you've gotta know why you're investing. For me, it's for income. My ultimate goal is I wanna build my, my investment portfolio to a certain level where the income that that provides for me, the passive income that that provides could then pay for and support my entire lifestyle, okay? So the way that I kinda look at it is like my investment portfolio is the golden goose that's laying the golden eggs, and the golden eggs are the income that I can then use to support my lifestyle. That for me is the ultimate source of passive income. You can make passive income in a business, but it's hard to make long-term passive income in a business because with business, you have to actively manage it. You've gotta be involved in all the decisions. There's ups and downs. You gotta to adapt to competition, to the marketplace, all that sort of stuff. And you can maybe make passive income for a while, but oftentimes if you're not actively managing or growing that, then that passive income slowly goes down. Because the internet, the world of business changes so fast, if you don't adapt to it, you're gonna get left behind. Stocks, on the other hand, I don't have to really manage that that much, especially with my approach and my, my philosophy of everything being long-term. Okay, I can set it and forget it. I can buy and just hold and benefit from the dividends from that. So for me, that's the truest form of passive income. And then usually, Dividend, dividend income, at least here in Canada, you also get taxed, taxed the best uh, on eligible dividends. So there's certain tax benefits as well. Um, there's a few other things I wanna share with you guys before I, I share my screen and go through my different accounts with you. Um, what I'm gonna show you guys is two different accounts, two primary brokerage accounts that I have. One is with RBC Direct Investing, okay? Another one is with Scotia iTrade. Now, the, also one of the reasons why I'm sharing with you guys these accounts is because I'm actually transferring all my stocks and assets to more of an international brokerage account. Um, I've yet to decide what that is yet, so I can be more transparent with you, with you guys because by the time this video is out, all my stocks are gonna be on a, a different brokerage account because I'm actually leaving Canada um, pretty soon and becoming a non-resident and there's restrictions. That's a whole different story. But anyways, I got two different accounts. One is for my holding company. Okay, I've got a holding company that holds a lot of my assets and I invest out of and one's a personal account, okay? Now the reason why I have a holding company and why a lot of wealthy people do this is because primarily they earn a lot of their wealth from their business and what they do is they don't want to, you don't want to invest out of your operating business because when you have an operating business like Project Life Mastery, I'm dealing with a lot of customers that in the event that anyone were to sue me, they could then go after those assets that would be within that, that company, the operating company. So instead what you do is you build a holding company. Now holding company then owns your operating company and then the money goes up to the holding company and with the holding company, that's what a lot of, a lot of the wealthy people do in order to invest in, own other businesses, buy stocks, real estate, all this sort of stuff. There's no liability with that or at least a lot less liability and, um, and that's typically the, the way that they do it. And the reason why that they won't take that money from their company and then pay themselves and invest 
is because oftentimes you'll get double taxed. So you get taxed on the corporate level, and then once you take the money out to pay yourself, you also get taxed on the personal level too. So that's why a lot of business owners, they leave the money in a holding company and they invest out of that, and then they own the holding company, okay? For me, a lot of that's changing because I'm, I'm, I'm moving to a new country and there's, there's a lot of uh, tax advantages and stuff. That's a whole different video uh, for a different time that I'll share with you guys. Um, but that's, I just want to explain that to you, the, why I have two different accounts. Um, I will also mention two years ago when I did that last video, um, that was primarily out of my operating company. I didn't have a holding company yet. So since then, I've actually got two brokerage accounts. I've got one for, I, I've, sorry, I actually have three accounts I'm going to show you guys. One's from my operating company, which I don't really invest in. All I do is foreign exchange type stuff with that. The other one is my holding company. The other one's my personal company. The holding company is new. I'm probably confusing you guys a lot. I apologize for this. Uh, the, uh, but anyways, the returns that you're going to see inside my account are more recent returns. They're not overall the returns that I've had over the years that I've been investing. Okay, So I want to just kind of make that clear too. Even though I'm still getting good, good returns at the time of this video, the market's been very volatile. There's a bit of a correction um, so earlier this year as well. Um, with that being said, guys, um, I'm going to dive into this. I'm going to flip over my screen. I'm going to show you guys, log into my accounts, be very transparent with you guys. Hopefully you guys can benefit and learn a lot from this. And let's begin. Okay, so right now I'm at the rbc.com website. RBC is Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, which is one of the top banks in Canada. They have uh, RBC Direct Investing, which is their brokerage account. Um, most banks have brokerage accounts, so if you want to set up your own brokerage or trading account to buy stocks, talk to your local bank. Um, you could also do research. There's also international brokerage accounts out there as well. I'm setting up an international brokerage account because I'm actually leaving Canada. There's restrictions on this account when I leave Canada. And also with RBC Direct Investing, you can only really buy in the US and Canadian markets. And I want to be able to buy more international in Mexico and Europe, South America, um, all over the world. So that's why I'm setting up more of an international account and transferring everything over. Uh, today is May 18th, okay? Um, as you can see, there's two different accounts that I have here. This one is for my operating company. I primarily use it for foreign exchange. And maybe that's another video I'll do at another point on how you can get the best exchange rate when you're transferring US to Canadian dollars and vice versa. Uh, this is for my holding company, okay? So this is the main account that I'm gonna show you guys and I'll also show you my, um, my, my personal account as well. Um, the total value of uh, in Canadian dollars, including the cash, is about 3.4 million, which ends up being about 2.6 2.6 million uh, U.S. dollars based on this exchange rate. Okay, so let me show you guys. I'll show you guys my uh, Canadian holdings and also my U.S. holdings as well. Um, my whole approach is, you know, you you want to diversify in both, but I benefit as a Canadian right now. I've benefited throughout the years on because uh, I mainly make US dollars in my business and exchanging that to Canadian dollars. So I primarily have invested in the Canadian markets, a bit in the US markets too, only about 250,000 in the US market, um, but primarily Canadian because I do, I, I just know the Canadian market a lot, a lot better than the US market, but I am, as I mentioned, going more international as well. Um, right now, my, my trailing 12 month return in this account is 3.15%. Uh, which is honestly not really that great. The market's been volatile up and down, but it doesn't really reflect the true return that I've gotten from investing uh, over the years. Because as I mentioned before, I didn't have this holding company, uh, this this holding company account two years ago. And so I was primarily investing before out of my operating company. But when I set up my holding company, I had to sell my stocks and then rebuy them and transfer them to this new account. So I've gotten you know over more than 12 months, a much greater return. Uh, than this, but as I mentioned before, I'm not really investing for that. One thing that a lot of people don't fully understand, I think, is whether it, your stocks go up or down, it doesn't really matter until you sell, okay? It's not until you actually sell that it really matters. So I have certain stocks I'll, sh I'll share, overall I'm up, but I have a lot of stocks that I'm down, that I've lost money thus far, but that's okay because when you have that long-term approach, and you, you've done the research behind what you're buying, you're not that affected when it's down because when it's down, you just look at that as a buying opportunity to buy the, those stocks at a discounted price because you're in it for the long term. And you know that long term, those stocks are gonna correct and they're gonna, you're gonna end up getting a great capital gain and appreciation. But again, all that only matters is if you sell. 
what I pr I'm primarily after my entire, not my entire, but most of my approach is after the dividends, the income that my stocks provide for me. And I'll share with you guys a little bit more about that, what that is. Because regardless of whether the stocks are up and down, I still get the dividends. The dividends is the income that they're paying out to me either every month or every quarter or every, every year based on the stock. Um, so that's how I look at it. I also look at it as because I'm a long-term investor, when there's a correction every year, that's a great buying opportunity. Recently, we had a bit of a correction in the market. Great opportunity to buy more at a discount. If there is a recession, which typically throughout history has happened every 10 years or so, I think we're due for one pretty soon. If there is one, it, I mean, it's, it sucks for a lot of people that, that lose their jobs and things like that. But when you have time on your side and you're a long-term investor, that's a great opportunity to buy more at a discount. You know, when I, in 2007, 2008, I wish that I knew what I knew now because I would have bought a lot of those stocks at a discount knowing that, you know, they would go up so much um, to where they're at today. So um, that's why I don't really worry too much up and down. Uh, but overall, you know, the unrealized gain has been $146,000 Canadian. This is just from my Canadian account and I'll show you guys. I'm not going to go into every stock. What I do recommend is if you guys want to do more research on some of the stocks, you guys can pause this video if you'd like, look them up if you like as well. But I'll share with you guys some of my favorite ones. Usually I like to so uh, sort everything by um, the change of what's down because Usually, I'm not, I'm not looking to sell stocks. I'm usually looking to buy, and when I can see what's down, um, for example, like these are the stocks that are down today, I'm usually looking to, to buy those ones if it's a significant enough uh, drop. But I'll organize things for you guys right now based on the market value just to show you some of the biggest uh, stocks first. As I mentioned, I really love bank stocks, bank, especially in Canada. Not, not all countries, because some countries, the banking, banking system is not that good or secure. Canada has one of the top banking um, systems in the world, um, and they pay great dividends. Okay, so all the bank stocks in Canada usually pay really great dividends, and they've been around for decades and will continue to be around for decades as well. Um, for example, Bank of Montreal, has never missed a dividend payment in over a hundred years, <laughs> so so you know you know it's a pretty secure long term investment. Um, okay, so the the biggest holding that I have in terms of bank stocks is Bank of Nova Scotia. Um, as you can see, of of you know I've, I've benefited from capital gain and appreciation, but again that only matters if I sell. But what I'm really after is the dividend. So um, Bank of Nova Scotia pays a really great dividend. Wait for this to load. Okay, um, so you can see it's about eighty dollars per share, but mainly what I'm looking at is the dividend. Okay, so this is what the dividend is based on the share. They do a, uh, the frequency is every quarter, and then the yield. Okay, the dividend yield is is one of the most important things. And then what I often do with the stocks too, because I don't need that income that it provides. So this is going to pay me a dividend dividend based on how many shares that I have every quarter. Okay, so every three months. Um, because I don't need the money, I have it on a drip. A drip is a dividend reinvestment plan. So basically, the money that would get paid out, it just goes to buying more shares. And that's how you really get that compounding effect over time because it just continuously keeps you know, uh, buying more shares. And then I, the more shares that I own, the, the greater the dividend I get as well. So that just keeps growing over a long period of time, which is really great. Um, okay, let's go back here. So Bank of Nova Scotia, I like. TD Bank as well, um, I like as well. That's gone up 18%, so that's great. You know, Royal Bank of Canada, Sun Life Financial, National Bank of Canada, Bank of Montreal. Um, now, I also have some of the communication companies, so these are like uh, communications in terms of internet, uh, cable TV, cell phone services, so that the, some of the biggest ones in Canada are Shaw Communications and TELUS, uh, so I own them. Shaw is actually down, uh, TELUS has been up. But Shaw pays a monthly dividend, which I like. I'm not sure if you guys hear that sound in the background, but that was actually my washing machine making that, no that noise. Okay, um, yeah, so they pay a monthly dividend, which is great, so great source of income for me. So even though they're down, you know, even though I've lost almost five grand, I'm not that affected by it because every month I'm getting a dividend that's buying more at this discounted price, right? So there's like dollar cost averaging that's happening where sometimes, it's going to buy more uh, when it's higher and lower, but over time, it builds up over a period of time. Um, 
you know, uh, CIBC is a bank. And just a variety, uh, one, one that I like here, it's not a dividend paying stock, which is Shopify. This is actually the one I've gotten the greatest return from. Um, as you can see, it's gone up 159%. And Shopify, you can buy on the Canadian and the U.S. market. But because I'm involved in online businesses, I also like to invest in what I know. And I kind of just kind of know, I, I know Shopify, I know Amazon, I know those kind of, because I'm involved in that business every single day and I work with people with that. But Shopify has been blowing up big time. So, um, you know, I'm only going to profit from this when I sell it. Um, but uh, eventually I will, and I just believe long-term, again, this is gonna continue to go up, or that Shopify might get bought out by Amazon. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty diversified across a lot of different sectors and industries. Um, some stocks I've been getting into that are a little bit more risky have been ca uh, cannabis stocks, especially in Canada. So this is a canopy growth. This is uh, like marijuana, cannabis, I'm sure you guys are aware of. Um, this has been going up, um, and right now, uh, I think these are it, it's more risky because it's based on government um, and laws that, that come out. But right now, things are, are at least moving along the track record of getting legalized in Canada, but also in uh, different states in the U.S. and also different parts of Europe as well. So that provides a great opportunity that even though you know some of these cannabis stocks can, can be a little bit more high risk, I'm willing to take that risk. Uh, with a, a, a small percentage of my portfolio because I believe that five, 10 years from now, not even next year or the next two years, but like five, 10, 20 years from now, cannabis and marijuana is going to be legalized and it's going to be a huge market. And that these stocks that I bought now, even though it's gone up 21%, eventually is going to be worth significantly more. Um, but I mean, I buy different energy stocks, um, technology stocks, so a variety of different you know financial stocks and whatnot too. So I'm not gonna explain each of them to you. This is another cannabis stock, this is an energy stock, this is a communication stock. Uh, BCE is like uh, Bell Communications. Uh, Manulife is a financial one. Rogers is communication stock. So as you can see, you know I have ones that, that have gone up. Uh, I've made money, I've lost money. Um, you know, this is a cannabis stock that's down 29%. This is a Cineplex, which is, this was actually a bad purchase. I, I do make some some bad purchases once in a while too. Um, and you learn from them, of course. But Cineplex is like an a entertainment company. They have movie theaters and things like that in Canada. And really, I mean, they're kind of, movie theaters are kind of dying, long, you know, in the future because now people are just watching things on Netflix now and there's not as much reason to go to a movie theater as there once was. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna slowly scroll through here. I'm not gonna explain each one to you. But as you can see, um, just in terms of these Canadian holdings, um, it's up 6%, so about $96,000. Now let's go to ETFs. Um, ETFs are um, exchange-traded funds. So these are usually the index funds that I was referring to. Um, so. The biggest one that I have here is the iShares uh, fund, but I like to diversify across a lot of different ones. So this one is the S&P 500 and the uh, the TSX. So those are um, the U.S. and Canadian exchanges, and basically what they do is they're they're very diversified across these different sectors, right? So at different times, you know, based on the market, you know, the energy sector might be down, or financial services might be up, or uh, communications might be up or down, but when you're diversified in this way, then um, you don't have to worry that much about it because it just kind of evens itself out. It's kind of replicating the market. So um, I like ETS for that reason, and uh, these ones also pay a dividend, okay, and they're also on a drip uh, as well. So I've got a, a variety here, mainly, uh, you know, like the S&P 500, um, some of them are bonds. So this one, for example, is a short-term bond uh, index. Um, this one is an aggregate bond index. Excuse me, this one is um, uh, an index fund for the uh, cannabis and the marijuana market. Also pays a dividend, which is great. So sometimes, I mean, in, in, for example, investing in one individual marijuana or cannabis stock is more risky versus buying an in index fund that owns all the different marijuana or cannabis stocks in the market, right? Because that way, if one goes under, 
you don't lose all that money, but it's more diversified in this index. Um, this is like a global all capital. So this is like a global market index of the entire world. Um, I'm, I, I'm actually not sure if it's the entire world, but I'm sure some of the biggest uh, countries in the world. Um, total market uh, fund, so it's not just the top 500 companies in the S&P 500, it's the total US uh, market. Uh, emerging markets, um, yeah, some of these I'd have to explain a lot more in depth with, but overall, you know, this has also been up by uh, 6.31%, $34,000. Uh, if I were to come down here, these are trust funds that I have. So usually these are real estate investment trusts that I buy. So for example, Chartwell is a retirement residence because um, right now a lot of baby, baby boomers are retiring. And so I see that as a good opportunity right now because they're going to need a lot of senior housing. Um, Ryocan, which has been down, they buy, I think they buy a lot of commercial real estate, uh, shopping centers, for example. So I can own, you know, I don't have to buy a shopping center and, you know, be a real estate investor. I could buy something like this, a real estate investment trust that owns, um, they have a portfolio of real estate of shopping centers, which is really cool. So that's one of the reasons why I love REITs. Uh, for example, this one owns American Hotels, which has been down. Uh, but um, overall, you know, uh, I've got a variety of different uh, 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 trusts and real estate uh, investments. This portfolio has actually been the, the, the smallest for me uh, thus far. It's barely up, and uh, it's been struggling a little bit. Okay, now let's go into some of the U.S. holdings. Um, I'm actually down overall in the U.S. market today. Um, so some of the biggest ones are Amazon.com. So that's been going up significantly, about 22%. I sell on Amazon. I know Amazon, I understand. I know how big they are growing and how international they're growing as well. So um, that's why I think owning Amazon, if you're an Amazon seller, you should also consider owning some of the stock too. I don't think this pays a dividend. Let me pull it up here. No, so it does not pay a dividend. A lot of the tech stocks in the US don't pay dividends, but I like to own them again anyways. And my strategy again around that is that I would eventually sell them. When I sell them, that's when I benefit from the capital capital gains and appreciation from it. Uh, Facebook, now Facebook actually went down significantly because of the whole Cambridge Analytica situation. But again, if you're a long-term investor, that's an opportunity to buy more. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, Facebook does not pay a dividend, but if I come down to the charts here, they had this huge dip. So everything was going good with Facebook, going up, boom, something happened, huge dip. Again, if you're a long-term investor, you're buying it cheap now. You're buying it from $150 to $160 per share, and then sure enough, it's gone back up. So that's what I look for as opp buying opportunities at least is I, I like to pay attention to the markets a little bit, not not every day, but um, for the most part, when certain things like that happen, I know I can go in there and buy more at a, a discounted price. Google, Apple, Tesla, so a lot of these companies are more the ones that you guys are gonna probably recognize. Uh, Netflix, of course. So Tesla's been down uh, for me so far, but I, I believe long-term in the vision of Elon Musk and, and um, that technology. Alibaba. Johnson & Johnson, Intel, Shopify, Wells Fargo, so some US bank stocks I own as well, um, Store Capital, Bank of America, Salesforce. Can Canada actually has a better banking system than the, the US, it's more secure than the US, um, but I like to own some US banks as well because even during the recession we saw, like for example, Bank of America dur during 2007, 2008 got hit really hard, but you know, again, it recovered. and. Often the U.S. too, the, the government will kind of bail out banks if need be. Uh, Salesforce.com, J.P. Morgan Chase, Berkshire Hathaway. This is owned by Warren Buffett. Um, pharmaceutical companies, Spotify. Uh, I think Spotify actually recently, recently went public. Let me just check. I think it did. That's why I bought it. Yeah. So they went public in April, which is really cool. So um, Oracle. I have some U.S. cannabis stocks, which are not doing well because it's it's more up in the air, especially in California right now. Um, Adobe, MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, Microsoft. So the U.S. market, there's, there's more companies that, that most people are going to be more aware of and learn more about. Um, 
But the reason why I haven't invested as much on the U.S. exchanges as I have the Canadian side is because I can benefit from the exchange rate as a Canadian, transferring U.S. dollars to Canadian dollars, and I get immediately a 25% to 30% return just on that. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so that that's for the most part that uh, account. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, account here I primarily just use for um, – foreign exchange, uh, a strategy called Norbit's Gambit that I might do another video to share how you can get better exchange rates, transferring US dollars to Canadian dollars and vice versa. Um, Cause it, a lot of, often the banks will give you really bad exchanges, but if you know the Norbit's Gambit strategy, you can get much better returns. Let me go now to my Scotia iTrade. Um, I use this for my personal investing. So this account is a lot less, um, 172,000 Canadian, okay? Um, I primarily invest out of my TFSA, which in Canada we call the tax-free savings account, which basically you get a limit of 5,000 or $5,500 a year that you can put into that, and then anything you make out of that is 100% tax-free. So pretty much everything that I buy here is actually all similar to what I have on RBC Direct Investing. Oh, I didn't go into the dividends yet. I'll, I'll share with you guys that. Uh, let me just show you guys this first. Um, so for the most part, I'm up overall here. I'm up by, let's see, 26% in this TFSA account. And again, you can see a lot of these are all Canadian stocks that I mentioned. So 26%, which uh, total is up $15,000, which would be totally tax-free. Uh, here with Scotia iTrade, they actually show you income you're generating from it. So for example, year-to-date, about $1,000 in dividends that I've made thus far from this account. And then I can see here uh, you know, what the yield is and what the annual income. So for example, Bank of Nova Scotia this year is going to pay me about $656 okay, um, income. Chartwell Retirement is going to pay me $117 uh, throughout the year. And then I've got the other account here too, which is just a cash account. And again, very, very similar holdings. Okay, so very similar to um, uh, my RBC Direct Investing. This one's been up 23% and uh, $18,000 is what's been made so far from that. So let me actually just go back here to my direct investing account to show you the dividends that I receive. So this is, like I said, my favorite source of passive income that uh, that you can make. So let me just go back to April. Uh, sorry, actually April 1st. So for the month of April, I made $11,000. I got paid $11,000 dividends. That's pure passive income. And right now from this investment account, it's not always 11,000 because like I said, some of them you get paid quarterly, some other every every month and others annual, but overall it's about $8,000 um, a month. So that's $100,000, almost $100,000 uh, passive income, okay, that I earned just from this stock portfolio account. And hold on, why is it not showing everything? Oh, I'm gonna go to the other account. So $100,000 pure passive income dividends. So that's my, my favorite thing about it. So as you can see here, as I showed on my other account, you know, this stock, $14, not much. Um, hold on here. You know, uh, TD Bank, $2,000. Okay, so I paid out a $2,000 dividend that I got. And because it's on the dividend reinvestment plan, you can see here it just went to, to buy more. So this amount of money went to buy more stocks. Um, you know, So some of the stocks that I have that are smaller, I'm not making it that much. I mean, $73, $24, $140. Uh, depends on how many short shares that I own, $400. Um, you know, Bank of Nova Scotia paid out $2,900 dividend to me um, from the amount of money that I have, which, which I think was around $250,000, right? So every quarter, I get $2,900 from that $250,000 that I have, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, as you can see, 
the most part, all these are different dividends. Uh, these ones all show zero. Um, but yeah, that's the ultimate goal. So my goal is to continue to build my portfolio to be able to, pr to provide my entire lifestyle. Now, $100,000 a year is an amazing amount that you know is more than enough for a lot of people to live off of, but that's the ultimate goal. That's money that you can totally retire off of, and as long as those investments stay intact and they're secure, blue chip, secure stocks that will continue to pay that dividend, then that for me is true financial freedom in the, the purest form, more than you could ever make financial freedom from a business because business changes a lot more and, um, and you're more diversified in this way than you are in your business. So anyways, hopefully this video helped you guys a lot. I didn't wanna to go too long with it. Uh, I mean, I could have gone more in, in depth into all the different things, but I just wanted to, got to, to show you guys what it looks like to have an investment portfolio like this behind the scenes, be as transparent as possible with you guys with everything, um, share with you guys what I've bought, what I've invested in, my approach, my mindset, my strategy. I think one of the biggest things to take away from this for you guys is just, Start small. Start with whatever you got. I mean, when I first started, the first investment that I made when I was five, when I was eighteen years old, was five hundred bucks. That was in a mutual fund, and I, I mean, I've had mutual funds for years. I don't own any any more because uh, I learned about the fees of mutual funds, and I, I just became more of a sophisticated investor. And I, I think index funds are a lot better than the mutual funds because there's not any. There's very 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 small fees for index funds. Um, but that, that's how I started, 500 bucks. And then you know, from there, I just kind of, uh, every month, kept paying myself, and I just put 10% you know, uh, of whatever I made, and I just slowly kind of start putting that into to buying more. And then as I started accumulating um, larger sums of money from my business and, and things, uh, and, and my job at the time as well, um, I would just have use more of that to invest. And I think the best starting point for people, again, is index funds. And you know, you're gonna have to do some research, but I recommend, uh, like an S and P 500 index fund, okay, uh, to 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 kind of be able to replicate the U S. Uh, the U S. exchange um, and the U S. market and economy. Um, that's probably a, a good way to start. Otherwise, you can look locally. Where depending on where you live, different opportunities there as well. But I think index funds is like the staple, the foundation to start with, and then um, investing in more individual stocks that you you at least have you you know it a little bit. Okay, so you don't often want to invest in things you don't know. Invest in things that you do know. So you know if you've got like an online business, for example, or, or you're in, you're involved in like technology and stuff like that, you could probably you know you know more about Amazon or you know more about Facebook or you might know about Google and things like that. And it might make more sense for you to invest in those first because you're in that industry, you know it, you know the future of it, you know all the changes and what's going on in it. And those are going to be some of the best places for you to start. Um, as well as maybe even considering bank stocks or, or things like that. But starting off with what you know and then kind of branching out from there as you gain more experience. And like I said, for me, my approach is more long-term, but your approach is gonna be different than me. It's gonna be based on your goals of life. It's gonna be based on your age. You know, If you're 60 years old and getting close to retirement, maybe you can't make certain riskier decisions that someone like myself would make at 32 years old. Right, because um, I have a lot of time on my side. Versus, if you're 60 or 70 years old, obviously your goals and your your, your um, what you're going to try to accomplish is going to be much different um, than someone in my situation. So, um, anyways, I'm going to wrap this video up. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed this, benefited a lot from it. Uh, leave a comment below. Um, I'll try to answer some questions that you guys might have, and of course, subscribe to my channel if you want to learn more from me, more videos. Um, on different ways that you can improve and master different aspects of your life. Thank you guys. Talk to you again soon.